about about the burning house. For a great part of our time, we've been in the burning house. And as our mind stabilizes, we're ready to put our, door, our toe out the door of the burning house and start to work on um, things that are um, essentially counterintuitive, uh, but some of the other aspects of Buddhism. And because we can see the extraordinary times we live in call for much more committed and dedicated work, uh, uh, we commit to exploring some of the more difficult things and working with things that are uh, counterintuitive. So when we think about ignorance, there are two layers of ignorance. There's the burning house, and that's all of disturbing emotions. Um, underneath the disturbing emotions is the main ignorance that gives rise to everything else. And the main ignorance is a belief in a inherently existing self. So that's what we're going to look at in some very simple ways today, uh, with some very simple examples, and meditate with that to see if we can just soften a little bit our belief that we exist separately and everyone else exists separate from us. So we're going to um, go through some very, very simple exercises. Um, I wanted to begin with uh, the first line of the Dharmapada, um, because I think that indicates uh, the work that we're doing um, as well, and holds everything. And I, I found two translations because I thought this is so important, we have to look at several different ways of understanding this. So the Dharmapada is a collection of verses that is thought to be the most uh, commonly read um, treatise on Buddhism. And it's from around the, the third century. And the first verse is, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts, with our thoughts we make the world. Um, another translation, all phenomena are preceded by the mind, issue forth from the mind, and consist of the mind. So we're looking at the relationship between our experience, our mind, and the creation of self and other, which gives rise to the creation of better than and less than which gives rise to all of the isms that we create in all of their myriad forms, which gives rise to violence. So we're going to see if we can, in simple ways, dismantle that just a little bit. So the first thing um, I wanted to do is look at the idea of just self and other. So, by itself, this is just an inset and stick, right? Just very, very simple. In relation to two other sizes, one is long and one is short. Without two other sizes, in relation, in dependence on each other, there's only the inset stick. Now there's long and short, right? Mm -hmm. So they're dependent on each other. Similarly, self is dependent on other. To me, I am myself, and all of you are yourself, right? But to you, you are yourself, you are, you are myself, everybody else is yourself. It's self and other are dependently arising. Okay? So test that out. Like, if I'm looking at you, you are yourself and I am myself. You are other and I am myself. But to you, you are yourself and I am other. They're conceptually dependent on each other. They're dependently arising concepts. Self does not exist without other. It only exists in relation to other. Okay? So let's just take a minute to sit with that. How is it that you are yourself to you? 
but to everybody else in the room, you're other, right? So let's go a little further with that and look at how we identify self as separate from other. What are the characteristics of self <coughs> that we hold on to with such fixation? So from, um, from the Buddhist perspective, we think of self in that it's permanent, it's singular, and it's autonomous or independent. Right? So when we think of ourselves, right? We know we're not permanent, logically, right? We know that when we were a child, we had different experiences, and we are not the same self we were when we were a child, right? So we, we can understand that logically. We don't think about it very much, but we can understand it logically. We know we're going to die one day, so we don't think of ourselves as permanent logically, even though we behave as though there's no death. We like to think, no matter what, there's another 20 years. <laughs> Not necessarily so, but we, we keep thinking there's another 20 years. All right, what we don't see is the moment-to-moment-to-moment -to -moment -to -moment, uh, change. Um, that would help us really start to get to what's permanent. What we don't see is the you you were this morning is different from the you you are this afternoon, right? We think we're the same. We have put all those moments in the day together and we think we have this unchanged self who's a narrator of our experience, right? We don't even question it. We just assume there's been no change. If we analyzed it minutely, we could say we had some definite experiences. And we could say, we've had delicious pasta. <laughs> so I have a new experience of, of a taste. Or we can say, um, I had an understanding of walking meditation. So we have a new experience, but we don't think of the moment-to-moment -moment shift. We think of ourselves as a continuity, right? Don't you think yourself of yourself as a continuity? If you looked at it really closely, you would be able to see that you were not a continuity. Um, we also think of ourselves as singular. So we think of um, all the different parts of our body, the different aspects of our brain, as one whole self. Right? We think of our hand as our hand, our foot as our hat, our foot, our um, eye as our eye. These are all lots of different parts, but we group them all together without thinking, and we think of self. 
And then the third is autonomous or independent. We control our own movements and actions. We exist in and of ourselves, distinct from whatever else there is in the world. Right? If you were to hit me, I would think there's a you that hit me, right? And that there's a me that received the hit. Okay? I would think I would have, that I had an experience of being hit. Yeah? Wouldn't you think you had an experience of being hit? Okay. <laughs> I love your expression. It's such <laughs> big eyes. <laughs> okay. So how do we unwind this? How do we crack this? How do we start to see if it is the way we believe it to be, or is it actually um, slightly uh, different reality underneath what we think it to be, or coexisting with what we think it to be? So in this system, um, we approach it from three different ways. We approach it from, let's look at the self really carefully to see if the self is what we think it is. We know we behave as though we are singular, autonomous, and uh, permanent, right? So we're behaving continuously under that view, but let's question that view. Um, we also think that you know, generally, without questioning, I would think all of you are separate from me. I can see that you're separate. I believe that I'm distinct, right? And um, we definitely behave as though we have many years ahead of us, or we would be practicing every second of every day. Oh, so um, we approach it from three ways looking at the self and unwinding our belief so strongly in the separate self, looking at what is separate, what appears to be separate, the phenomenal world, and compassion. So the reason we are working with the kindness meditation throughout the weekend is on the one hand to develop our training in kindness, but on the other hand to really see what happens when you soften the boundaries between self and others from the perspective of compassion and kindness. How does that soften that separation in the distinct self separate from all others? So the fruition of the compassion practice is when there is no self, no summoned compassion that's being practiced, and no other to whom the compassion is being extended or to whom the loving kindness is being extended, right? So as we gradually train in all three of those modes, we start to look at this counterintuitive potential that things aren't necessarily the way we think they are. I love the way the compassion practice, the kindness practice works over time. Um, we were talking a little bit this morning about um, the feeling of openness, the feeling of openness when we're sitting in the loving kindness um, sensation and the sitting of openness when we were at the ocean. So, um, this is tulip season in Maine. Um, and I really, I love watching the tulips because they start really, really like a tight bud. And so as our defenses lose their strength, at least in our own imagination, the tulip opens. And then I particularly like the tulips because they open so wide that all the petals fall away. And that's how this sense of self and the openness of mind start to work together through compassion until the boundaries fall away and there's no self that's practicing, no compassion being practiced, no other to whom it's extended. So all of these three things work together. Um, to work on self, um, we're going to start with just direct experience. What is our direct experience like? Uh, that's the easiest way to begin to question um, the dichotomy of self and other. To just say, okay, I, I think I see the world in just this way, right? Okay. Um, Monty, can you lift the orchid and stick it up here? Yeah. I, want, I want everybody to be able to see the orchid.
So our direct experience is that we have created multiple dimensions of other. Uh, so I'd like you to think about all the different ways we create other in our life, first of all. So um, if we think about how we sort and classify things and how that gives rise to our perception of differences. So we have the incense stick with the long and the short. Um, when I was thinking about um, bias and um, all of the different isms, I started recalling um, my first experiences when I was teaching in Maine. And I thought it was so interesting. I moved to Maine from Pennsylvania. Um, and in the first day of school, I was asking everybody to say their names. And uh, there was someone with a long French name. And I had a little bit of difficulty pronouncing that name. And he said, oh, it's OK. I'm French. I'm, I forget what he said, but it was very um, uh, depreciating of himself. And since I did not live in Maine, I didn't know what he was talking about. What could being French have to do with being lesser? My family at the time was living in New Orleans. New Orleans was um, a place where it was owned by uh, colonial French rule, and they were the aristocracy. So my view of French was usually that's aristocracy. His view of French, it was the, the lesser. It was totally culturally dependent and language dependent. So we create all kinds of differences and all kinds of others. The key word is we create, and we create them in our minds. And as soon as we create self and other, from the moment self and other arises, there is just, even in the most uh, wonderful samsaric person, <laughs> the sense that I have to protect this self, at least a little bit. And I can help other, but only to a degree. I can't endanger self in helping other, right? So we start these different degrees of how open we can be, where our defenses are, where our boundaries are. And then we start to go crazy with it. So if you think of um, the Yankees, it's my team. I'm going to go to the baseball game, and I want my team to win. This is my team. My niece goes to the Yankees. <laughs> I don't know what the other team is, but there's definitely another team. So everybody is screaming and yelling for their team and suffering if their team isn't succeeding, right? right. Yes, over a very simple thing. It's as, you know, almost as um, incomprehensible as language. <laughs> so just take a minute to look at, first of all, what you think of as self and other to you. Where your boundary is for other. Is it with your family? Is it with you personally? How far do you go with your family? Do you go to how many distant cousins before it becomes other? How many others in your life have you created? How do you distinguish in your mind self and other? What does that look like to you?
One of, one of the things that really interests me is the, the Buddhist science of perception and how we explain it. Um, and I find it tremendously helpful, um, particularly because it helps me to understand how we create bias in our minds, exactly how it arises, um, and how fundamentally confused it is. So um, if we think of how our senses work, we all see this flower, right? You can all see the flower. You are yourself, it is itself, right? You're separate from the flower. This is myself over here, it's over there, right? At the same time, you're seeing the flower. So how is that possible? Does your mind go out and touch the flower? Does the flower come over and touch your mind? The flower is matter. Your mind seeing the flower is thought. There is no inner flower in your mind, right? It never came over and inserted itself in your mind. All you are seeing is thought flower, right? It's over here. You didn't even walk over and touch it with your finger. It's over there. You're over here. It's matter. You're seeing a thought. So just sit, sit with this again, because we have all these experiences that we think are absolutely true, that they're certifiable, that we're all seeing the same orchid, for instance, and that we're seeing it in exactly the same way, and we're having exactly the same experience. We don't know that the appearing flower is the same in each of our minds at all. What we are experiencing is something in our mind. How does the flower get into your head? Really think about it. Is your mind traveling over there to the flower? Does your mind go beyond the boundaries of your body? Does the flower have a presence that's not matter that can, can come into your mind? How does it happen?
So this is, this is the beauty of our practice. You can see when you're trying to consider something like this. In the first place, it's counterintuitive to your experience or your sense, our confused sense of reality. Um, and you can see that as soon as you try and focus on something like this, your mind wants to wiggle around and stop thinking about it or go in and out of other kinds of thoughts. So with our shamatha practice, we want to be able to focus long enough that we can have certainty. Is there some way my mind contacts the flower? Is there any way the flower contacts my mind? Is it possible that there's no direct contact between the phenomenal world that is certainly there in terms of arising appearances, but is there any direct contact with this self that thinks it's seeing this flower? Another way to think about it is to look at uh, the mechanics of how the senses work. Um, and in the Buddhist sciences, we divide it up in terms of a couple of different functioning parts. Right? So I have an eye organ, right? Um, so that's one part. Um, within the eye organ, I have an eye faculty. So having an eye organ is not enough. A blind person can have the actual organ of the eye, but not the faculty that receives the sensory data. So we have the eye organ, the eye faculty, and the eye consciousness that receives the data from the faculty. The eye organ the eye faculty and the eye consciousness are not conceptual. They can't think. They can't make any judgments. That They can't name orchid or pink. Okay. The eye organ and the eye faculty are actually matter. The eye consciousness can receive color and form. It can't then think organ, orchid. This is the same that's true in um, Western science. The eye receives pixels that it can organize into some sort of boundaries. That's all that happens in the, in the eye uh, from Western science also. So how does it become orchid? From this perspective of Buddhist science, it happens in three moments. So there's contact between the eye organ, the eye faculty, the orchid, and the eye consciousness, like a mirror reflecting. And it's color and shape. That's all it is. Color and shape. No conceptual thinking. So the first moment, there's that contact. And it is like the incense sticks in terms of dependent arising. You have to have <laughs> the flower. <laughs> the eye organ and the eye faculty and the eye consciousness making contact, right? If one of those are not there, there's no orchid. What arises in our mind is something totally abstract. Whether you call it the collection of pixels that have boundaries or whether you call it shape and color. It's still something that's abstract. 
Um, you can tell that it's like that by just looking at the orchid and then closing your mind to see what is in your mind of orchid. Try that for a minute. See what I mean about it being sort of abstract and indistinct? Even just closing your eyes, right? What arises in our mind is this ephemeral, abstract, color form data that we call, it's <coughs> technically called in Buddhist and science an isolate. And what we are actually doing is going through a sorting process saying it's not a sunflower, it's not a cosmos, it's not a daisy, it's not this, not this, not this, not this. I will call this combination of not this orchid. Okay, all we're seeing is color and form and we give this particular ratio of color and form this abstract ephemeral thought shape a name and then we combine it with all the other orchids we've ever seen and we combine all of the parts of this plant into orchidness and think we know orchid right you following me this far Yes. <laughs> so your eye can receive the visual data of color and shape and it can see a moment of this orchid right um, your hearing can't hear an orchid that's not making a sound your scent your capacity to smell can't smell the visual orchid. What I'm trying to say is your sense data is specific to its sense consciousness. And it's specific to the present moment. So you get one set of data and your mental consciousness does this whole sorting process. And let's say I love flowers, so next outside my window is a lilac. If this were a lilac, I would be receiving color and smell at the same time, right? But it wouldn't be the same sense consciousness. The mental consciousness would be receiving smell data, taking it in. The eye consciousness would receive the visual data and take it in, and I would conflate the two and get lilac in my mental consciousness. My mental consciousness is only reacting to the received data. My mental consciousness is not reacting to the sense data that has contact. So that naming and defining and judging is all happening in my mental consciousness unique to me. There's no contact between my mental consciousness and any phenomenal form in the relative world. Not only that, um, even more subtly, my eye organ, I faculty, um, the object, and the sense consciousness go out 
receive the data like a mirror going out is not a good way to say it but the there's a reflection of visual data in the first moment in the second moment there is a extremely subtle like dislike neutral okay we name that like dislike neutral we say that it's mental it's a mental phenomena but we never talk about it as a mental event or classify it as one of the mental events. It's not an emotion. It's an extremely subtle yes, no, or neutral. Um, almost like, um, if you can think of a magnet, like a, a non-material pulling towards, a non-material pushing away, or a non-material neutral. It's not conceptual. It's not judging how much I like it, what degree of like, dislike. It's a pull towards that we think of as pleasant, a push away that we think of as unpleasant. So the eye organ and eye faculty meet the orchid in the first moment. There is a fleeting, subtle like, dislike, neutral. And then there is an identification of the data, ORCID, and a fully formed thought like dislike. The fully formed thought like dislike neutral then goes, it's my favorite flower, my mother had these flowers, oh I saw them in the shrine room, I have such attachment to the shrine room. All the range of conceptual responses and reactions. Okay. The really important thing about this is that there is no direct contact between the conceptual shifting and sorting and any direct sensory experience. Which is to say, we are all biased all the time about all our experiences. There is no direct true experience. There is continuously a sorting going on that is coming from our side. Has nothing to do with the poor orchid, right? Absolutely nothing. The orchid is matter, our minds are material. They never ever met. So we have to really start to see, if we are all biased all the time, how do we start to unwind and um, have a more clear picture instead of being caught up in some sort of confusion. Um, I'm going to give you something, another experience to help you with this. Um, so the great thing about Buddhism is not to um, take anything literally or on faith, but really hammer it out to see if it's true. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to give you something to taste. One of my students really put a lot of thought into something no one probably had ever tasted. It's vegan. <laughs> if you have an extreme allergy that you're worried about, don't worry. Just don't put out your hand. Okay. And uh, Sister Soma, if you would help me with this. Mm -hmm. So the organ of your tongue and the sense consciousness associated with taste will meet with this object. And I want you to just observe what happens. taste you probably haven't had before. So just put out your hand if, if, you're, if you are a little concerned. If you really don't trust me at all, <laughs> don't worry. It's not forced. What I want you to do is see what it's like 
when there's a taste that you don't have a name for, that you can't conflate with other experience. You don't have to wait, you can um, taste it when you receive it. And look at several things. Where is taste located? How does the sensation of matter become thought? Really take your time with it. So again, is it your mind identifying taste? Is it a thought? Is it the object on your tongue? How does your mind try to identify something you have no name or experience for? Is your mind on your tongue?
if your mind is on your tongue, what happens when a plane flies overhead? And all of a sudden you hear a loud sound. Before you tasted this, you didn't have an automatic like-dislike impulse because you didn't have that experience before, right? Now you would have a definite like-dislike that you could identify. It would be much more coarse. Um, but the, the subtle one probably just, you know, just swept by in the experience of identifying the substance. Essentially, um, according to this system, um, there are only six tastes, sweet, sour, bitter, pungent, astringent, and salty. And essentially, we're sorting through ratios mm -hmm. and then giving a name to a ratio. It's not as bitter as something. It's not as astringent as something. You're trying to find a way to identify taste, right? And your mind is sorting. This is actually um, a vegetable they eat a lot in India. It's called bitter melon. Mm -hmm. Bitter melon chips. Mm -hmm. If it was intrinsically dislike, then it wouldn't be sold as a popular snack, right? So there's no intrinsic true existing dislike. In Maine, they used to sell seaweed as candy. Would we think seaweed is candy? I don't think so. <laughs> I like some seaweed, but not, not the kind they sold as candy. But if it was intrinsically good or intrinsically bad, there would be a universal reaction to the taste. But there isn't. So this is really, really important um, to really get some certainty about. That there is no direct contact. Your sensory organs, faculty, and consciousness have direct contact, but they don't think. Your sixth consciousness, mental consciousness, contacts the image that you put in your brain based on the very small amount of ratio data you received, right? And then your brain ran with it. Oh, this is really horrible. I never want to try this again, right? <laughs> As opposed to, oh my goodness, it's bitter. <laughs> this is what bitter tastes like. All of the light dislike, good, bad, um, criticisms, judgments, defining, went on as thoughts in your head that had no direct contact with the actual object. We are all biased all of the time sure. about every experience we have. <laughs> So I'd like you to really sit with this, and if you'd like um, to go out in the garden um, and just pick which sense you want to work with. If you want to work with hearing, this is a great place to work with hearing. <laughs> <laughs> you have planes. It was really good at the beach because um, a helicopter and plane went in different directions. Um, so you had moment by moment shifting in sound. But is, is your experience of sound a thought you are having with 
no direct contact unique to you, to your own bias about that particular sound, or continually creating your own bias about that sound? Is it inside or outside? Your mental world, where is it? And what is its relationship to matter? So um, there's a lot more bitter melon if you'd like to try that. <laughs> and um, if you'd like to sit outside um, and work with hearing, or you can work with sensation on your skin um, in terms of heat, where is your mind and how does your experience of the world turn into thoughts? And where is your responsibility in terms of the thoughts and how the thoughts then elaborate? I love uh, one of the translations of thoughts, of discursive thought, is elaborations. So this, in this context, it really makes sense. It was a taste of bitter that became, it's the worst thing I've ever had, or where's the water, or um, all of these other uh, judgments that you made after the fact as totally mental constructions or elaborations based on the small amount of sensory data. Okay? So let's um, give yourselves some time. The uh, wonderful thing about this weekend is we can, we can really take a little time with it. So the idea is we're presenting something. It's counterintuitive. And so then you test it out and you test it out until you get a lived experience. Oh, I do see something, or I didn't see something, I'm gonna keep testing it, right? So you want to have your own sense of, um, this is what Buddhist science says. Do I have certainty about that or not? How can I really think about this, look at this, mull it around, do my thoughts that I think of as a real direct experience. You know, we think we're all seeing this room in the same way, and that if the policeman came in, we would all give the same witness statement, right? But our thoughts are elaborating in ways unique to us. Did your mind touch the flower? Did the flower walk over and touch your mind? How did the flower become a thought? Okay, um, we'll ring the bell, but give yourself, and um, all we're trying to do is a little, make a little dent, a little crack. Um, you might go into retreat for a long time with these questions. Um, we're just trying to crack the shell a little bit in our certainty that we are a self with direct experience that knows exactly what it is we're seeing in an unconfused way. Whereas the definition of samsara is seeing our experiences in a confused way. Okay. It's a lovely day. Hey. Go ahead and sit in the shrine room or outside. Um, I would stick, I would try and stick with one of your sense uh, capacities. Smell, taste, touch, hearing. <coughs> Sight. Okay.